Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I welcome you to this very early morning session. Thank you for coming. And um, uh, I'm Goran Milosinovic, uh, the um, cardiologist and the professor of, of medicine. And beside that, I'm the president of the uh, Serbian uh, Commission for Collaboration with the UNESCO. Having said this, um, I would like to uh, um, uh, underline again that the um, uh, Commission for the Collaboration uh, with, with UNESCO uh, uh, um, participated in the agenda also in, the, in this program, and I thank very much Mr. Neskovic and, and, and the rest of the organizers to give us opportunity. Um, our modest contribution was this poster session that you may see of the, of the young scientists, uh, as you know, in the UNESCO, the agenda, in the, in the top of the agenda is beside the, the, science, the, the, the gender equity and the, the young scientists. So we're happy to have our uh, L'Oreal Balkan uh, winners of, of, for, for the female uh, young scientists uh, being presented here together with the big, uh, big names in, 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 in basic science. So let's go, let's go back to, the, uh, to, to this morning session. Uh, today we are going to be much more close to, to, the, to do the clinical science. The gap between the, uh, the, the cellular and the uh, and genetic science and, and, and the, and the uh, um, uh, clinical science, I would say, sometimes exists. But um, there are binders and the, um, to, today we are going to have three distinguished lectures. And uh, I call first one, Mr. Isaac Witz from the University of Tel Aviv to deliver us the lecture on the um, cancer entitled Cancer is Sustained by its Microenvironment. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you very much and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Neboja and the organizing committee for inviting me to uh, uh, present this lecture. I'd like uh, for all of us to start and be on the same page. So let me uh, give you a small um, explanation what cancer is, and I apologize for the simplicity of this uh, slide. Cancer is caused by mutations in genes that control cell proliferation function, and these genes are in three families, oncogenes, tumor-suppressor genes, and DNA repair genes. Um, the, these genes played a very important role uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, where the notion was that these, the oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and DNA repair genes are the A and the Z of cancer. And uh, the people who, uh, among the people who contributed to this notion were Mike Bishop and Harold Ramos, and they got the Nobel Prize for uh, oncogenes in 89. The one thing they didn't take into account that uh, a very important event, the original sin, is indeed the formation of cancer. But what kills cancer patients is not the primary cancer. These are metastases. And over 90% of uh, cancer patients die of metastases. So, and it was very, well, not very quickly, but it was realized at, at a certain point that the cancer-centric view did not provide a satisfactory mechanism for metastasis formation and sustainability. If not cancer genes, what is responsible for the 
uh, metastases. Now, this gentleman provided an answer in 1889. This gentleman was called Stephen Paget. He was a pathologist who was interested in the fact that certain cancers, when they send metastases, metastases don't develop in all organs. They reach all organs, but don't develop. They only develop in certain organs. And he is regarded as the pioneer of uh, site-specific metastases. Uh, he wrote a, I think, very deep uh, sentence, the following. When a plant goes to seed, its seeds are carried in all directions, but, can, but they can only live and grow if they fall on congenial soil. In today's nomenclature, the seed are the cancer cells, the soil is the microenvironment, and we'll get immediately to the, what, what is the tumor microenvironment. Um, and a few years later, I heard a lecture by a, a US pathologist who is also not anymore with us. Um, uh, his name was Morris Black. And he said that cancer is associated by the, is uh, surrounded by the patient. There should be, if you think about it, there should be some connection, some interplay, some crosstalk between the patient and the, and, and the, and the cancer. What is the tumor microenvironment? The tumor microenvironment, or TME, is jointly created by cancer cells and by resident and infiltrating non-cancerous cells. So there is a unit. And what, for instance, non-cancerous cells are lymphocytes, are myeloid cells, are uh, other blood cells, are fibroblasts, uh, blood vessels, and so on and so on. And what I already told you, that cancer cells engage in a wide-ranging crosstalk with the tumor microenvironment. The field became very popular uh, as evidenced for the, from the number of publications. If you see here, these are the publications uh, from uh, 1970 to 2016. And as you can see that uh, until the early 2000s, there was a relatively little interest, but then there was an expo exponential growth in the interest as manifested by the number of publications that deal with the tumor microenvironment. Uh, at that time, uh, some of us uh, formed and created the International Cancer Microenvironment Society. Um, here is the website of this uh, society, if you are interested. I looked at it yesterday. It's not very, uh, it's not very much uh, up to date, but uh, uh, I see to it that it will. I served as the uh, founder and the president of this um, uh, society until 2015. Uh, we had uh, quite a f we had eight international uh, meetings. Uh, in various uh, places in Europe, and one meeting in China in Suzhou. This is for my own lab. I started my interest in the tumor microenvironment by looking at the uh, immune uh, microenvironment, in other words, at the interaction between uh, antibodies or uh, immune cells, such as lymphocytes, uh, and, and cancer cells, and then uh, went to uh, a look at the general problem of uh, interactions between the microenvironment and cancer cells. And this is, I think, one of the studies that I'm most proud of. First of all, because a, it was a first, not, not mine, but uh, it was the first in the literature, showing that the microenvironment really affects the uh, tumorogenicity, the ability 
of cancer cells to form tumors. Uh, you see here the growth of, uh, of uh, uh, tumors by two what is here letters. One is C, and these are cultured cells. You can uh, transform uh, normal cells in the test tube by simply gene transfer. And if you Uh, and this we did, but on the right-hand side, the C are just cells that grow in the test tube. They are normal, uh, but they are transformed. In other words, they have a gene that enables them to make tumors. On the left, there are the same cells, exactly the same cells, but these cells were, as I told you, transformed in vitro with a, a oncogene and then transplanted once for one uh, passage in mice and, the, and then put back into culture. So uh, CTC means culture, tumor, culture. One passage in vivo. And as you can see, these cells are much, much, much more efficient in their ability uh, uh, to make tumors. So the in vivo environment accelerates tumor, tumorogenesis very much. In other words, the environment, this is here is a general environment, but in the micro environment, the one that uh, uh, is in a very close vicinity uh, to tumor cells, um, has a huge impact on the ability of cells to make uh, tumors. Let me now uh, give you some, actually five examples of realities of the crosstalk between the tumor microenvironment and cancer cells. Heraclitus, about 2,500 years ago, is said to, uh, uh, to uh, have said the following sentence, you cannot step into the same river twice, for fresh waters are ever flowing. The message of this uh, slide is that tumors are the same. Uh, the phenotype of the tumor and of its tumor microenvironment change as a function of time. In other words, the cancer tumor microenvironment crosstalk is dynamic and bidirectional. It leads to an ongoing, ongoing phenotypic remodeling of both these interaction partners. The uh, cancer tumor microenvironment crosstalk either can, um, either can um, uh, enlist non-cancerous cells to support cancer progression towards metastases. Here on your left is a crosstalk between a cancer cell and a cell called macrophage. This is a cell that is uh, supposed to protect us against microbes, against foreign materials, uh, and so on. But factors are released from cancer cells make these macrophages to collaborators. And these collaborators help by various mechanisms the cancer cells to, uh, 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 to promote uh, themselves and to progress towards metastases. Another reality is that the cancer tumor microenvironment crosstalk either can drive tumor progression or blocks it. In other words, the microenvironment has hundreds, possibly thousands of material, and they, they act in opposing ways. Uh, the balance between these opposing effects determine the state of malignancy. If it tilts one way, the tumor progresses towards metastases. 
if it tilts the other way, and this is unfortunately a rather uh, a rare event, uh, there is a spontaneous regression. And in most cases, possibly in some of us, there are dormant tumor cells. We are healthy. These dormant tumor cells don't do anything. Uh, but maybe under certain circumstances and with time, they may progress towards metastases. So this is, uh, these tumor cells are in the state, in a state of dormancy. Now, um, single microenvironmental components may, under specific circumstances, exert pro or anti malignancy functions. And let me give you an example from my own lab of uh, three years ago. Uh, you see here two cells. The red one is a melanoma cell that has uh, metastasized to the brain. The green cell is the macrophages of the brain called microglia. And here they interact, but nothing happens. The, 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 the microglia cells doesn't do anything. I uh, always amuse the uh, people in my lab by saying they seem, they seem to me to be making love uh, because uh, they really uh, uh, seem to be happy on both sides. But it could be different. Here is the same green cell, which is the macrophage, the microglia. The red cell is the melanoma. And in this case, the same type of cells that made love to, my, to melanoma cells, in this case, the a green cell, the macrophage or the microglia, kills the tumor cell. The last example that I'd like to give you is that cancer cells hijack physiological elements, regulatory strategies, signaling pathway uh, from the microenvironment. An example uh, which you read a lot, even in the uh, daily papers, is that the hijacking uh, of the immune checkpoint strategy, which is employed by lymphocytes to control unwanted immune responses, uh, promotes cancer progression. This is the uh, Santa Maria in Palmis Church on the Via Appia in Rome. According to tradition, this is the place where Peter, who escaped Rome uh, from being crucified, met Jesus, who was on, its, on his way to Rome to be re-crucified. And the tradition said uh, that Peter said, Domine quo vadis. But you know, you don't ask your boss, where are you going? My interpretation here is, that Peter, who was, uh, who really suffered, said, we Catholics are persecuted, are killed, are crucified. Where are we going? What should we do? The same question we can ask about cancer research. Where are we going? Well, there are two ways that everybody talks about it. Prevent and Cure, therapy. Let me just say a few words about therapy. A therapy, one way to, of therapy would be to obstruct cancer sustainability by its microenvironment. One can boost tumor microenvironment interactions that antagonize tumor progression, or one can block tumor microenvironment interactions that promote tumor progression. Uh, <clears throat> these gentlemen uh, approached, uh, the, uh, did the second approach, they blocked. What they did is to neutralize the immune checkpoint strategy that was hijacked by tumor cells, and for that they got the Nobel Prize. As a uh, summary of what I'm saying, let me cite to you two sentences which uh, were actually uh, uh, brought to my mind uh, because cancer, cell, cancer is sustained by its interaction with the tumor microenvironment in a complex interwining network of dynamic signaling pathways. 
Now, in 2015, Kolsch uh, published the, uh, the following question. Will this complexity overwhelm any hopes for effective therapies, or will it enable us to design better and personalized therapies? The question that uh, my former graduate student and I provided three years later was the following. The contemporary developments in systems biology, bioinformatics, and analysis of big data, coupled with a less reductionist and a more holistic outlook at data, bear promise to at least manage if not cure many cancer types. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank my devoted, clever, and uh, a very hardworking group that their work allows me to uh, go around and talk while they do the work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ritz. Um, uh, we will leave the discussion for the end of the session. So I call now the second speaker, um, Professor Jelena Radulovic for the Department of the Neuroscience and uh, Psychiatry from the Albert Einstein College uh, of Medicine in New York City. Please. Thank you, Nebuchadnezzar organizers, uh, distinguished chair. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and for a change, uh, today I will not present my data because I primarily took the advantage here to learn more than to present what we normally do. And what I learned is about sustainability. When Nebuchadnezzar invited me to give the talk, my thoughts first was, what do I know about it and what this is all about? And I can tell you briefly what was my discovery along this preparation which I believe could be relevant uh, for topics that I research, which is basic science of the brain and how it relates to the origins of mental illness. Uh, by the way, I, I am a basic scientist, obviously, although I have an MD degree. I work with mice. I work with rodent models, but I also direct the translational program at Einstein because we are trying very hard to translate our data to uh, human diseases. Okay. So I will start not with the horrifying numbers about the origins of mental diseases, but by pointing out that these diseases are actually increasingly afflicting younger populations. So what is really becoming shocking is not just the epidemic of mental disease, but the early onset of these diseases. And currently uh, we have uh, around 50% of mental health conditions start at the age of 14 and 75% of them are afflicting actually the productive, creative force uh, of our future. Uh, uh, how do we tackle this challenge? Well, so far we have not done great and we have mainly used many different words to improve things in the uh, our mental health. We have changed the uh, term neuroscience and uh, uh, enriched it with transformational, translational, interdisciplinary, and now I heard sustainable. So my first thought was to see whether this really will help us move ahead and what exactly would that mean? And when I looked first at the uh, goals of sustainability, I noticed that uh, uh, good health, uh, obviously, is uh, one of the key goals of this initiative. However, when I looked at the approaches, and I will not list them, don't worry, I will not read any of this, but if you quickly go through these three slides, you will see uh, that uh, there is no mention of basic science at all. And then finally, I found a paper which said, global mental health research, time to integrate basic science, what cheered me up a bit. And the typical words were there, we'll have translational science and integrative science and interdisciplinary work and then highlighted that now we will focus on creating integrated understanding and embrace both biological and environmental variables. And then I thought, wait a minute, I thought we were already doing that. Is that really new? Is that what sustainable approaches will help us achieve? We have worked with preclinical models uh, on uh, uh, drug development, 
Uh, all everything we know about the benefits of exercise were done in preclinical models. Research on uh, uh, stress and overcrowding was done. Uh, research on environmental enrichment was done. So all these things which are now at the forefront of interest in sustainable uh, uh, science is something that actually we have been working on for many years. So why have we not really uh, uh, got the success and the achievement that we were hoping for? Uh, well, mental disorders are disorders of the mind and we don't know what is the mind. So we actually don't know the key substance of the subject that we are studying mm -hmm. and the key problem that causes mental illness. Uh, if you look at the definitions which are most prominent on our websites and around the world, you will see that they are as confusing and as vague as uh, is under our understanding of the mind. Uh, and I can tell you what I believe the mind is. I don't think that the mind is a part or I don't think that the mind is uh, uh, a phenomenon. I think that the mind is our subjective experience of ourselves and the world. And I think it is as subjective as our thoughts and our feelings, as our motivations and moods. And I do believe that they stem from a very significant integrative process, which is makes, making sense of streams of information which get into our nervous system and uh, uh, getting out of us through our interactions with ourselves and the world. Uh, so if one thing that we know about the mind is that it is an emerging property of brain activity, and we know that part of it entails conscious processing of information. Uh, however, the only theories of mind that we have at the moment are actually rooted in physics, although it was biology that was dealing with the brain over so many years. And the only currently uh, uh, existing theories of the mind and consciousness are by Mayer and Penrose and Hemeroff. They're somewhat different, but both involve quantum phenomena uh, uh, emerging well, according to Penrose, from uh, oscillations of molecules in the brain, according to Mayer, through iterations of some uh, different fields uh, surrounding uh, uh, all living organisms. Uh, probably the truth lies somewhere else. These are really never confirmed or never uh, exactly tested findings, but they are a framework we can follow. And uh, I think that the only way we can help the mind understand itself, which means understand, may help ourselves understand the mind, is through uh, uh, combined and concerted efforts by teams combining physics, mathematical modeling, computer science, and life sciences. And because I am a life scientist, I will really from now on focus only on that. Because if we assume that the mind stems from the brain activity, and I do believe that we have ample data to claim that. Uh, uh, one way to actually work with the mind, even without knowing what it is, is to understand better the workings and the mechanisms of the brain. Uh, just to let you know the complexity of the brain, it has about 200 billion neurons, which are interconnected through 100 trillion connections. And uh, although we have at the moment increasing uh, uh, sophistication and complexity of computers, it is very unlikely that anytime soon we will have a system which has this type and level of processing capacity as it is the brain. Now, if we all agree that at some level, maybe even the most fundamental level, the brain is primarily a processor of information, uh, then it is also worthwhile acknowledging that this processing occurs at many levels as well. So uh, we have tried and we have gone back and forth from the whole brain and back to single molecules and then from single molecules and back all the way up to the brain. And uh, we haven't really got very far in understanding the mind, but we have discovered many important things that I would like to highlight. First of all, we know that brain, uh, the brain exists as a very complex and a very beautiful electrical network of interconnected areas. This is diffusion tensor imaging of the brain where you can see the entire white matter uh, linking uh, uh, both intracortical, intra-regional and uh, 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 long uh, distant uh, brain regions and uh, the rest of the body. We also know that the brain functions in clusters of regional networks. For example, uh, uh, and this is really interesting because to observe patterns of activity which relate to function, 
we see synchronous activity of brain regions who are not necessarily connected with hard wires. Sometimes simple oscillations in different frequencies will synchronize and trigger activities of the either visual cortical areas, areas that are involved in sensory motor processing, motor function, or areas which are involved with memory uh, storage and uh, uh, reflection and thinking and creativity. Then we have a lot of uh, uh, computation occurring at uh, the level of nerve cells, their synaptic contact and their connectivity also within certain areas and within brain microcircuits. And lastly, well, actually it's not lastly, there is more. We have all this computational power of signaling, which happens at the level of nerve cells, as well as at the level of their uh, subcellular compartments. For example, this is the proton of a synapse. Look at this complexity of a single synapse of a neuron. So that's something that we have to deal with to understand the vastness of the brain. And we have exactly the same thing happening when we look at the nucleus and the soma, where we have all these microRNA networks which regulate all kinds of different phenotypes and gene expression. Uh, yesterday we had a very nice talk during my session when the colleague was discussing about the computational power of proteins and how single changes of a, of a single protein can change the state of a cell. If we only change the phosphorylation state of a protein or nitrosylation state or any kind of modification, the state of the cell will change. The moment the state of the cell will change, the whole network will change. So just as an illustration. So I do believe that we need to continue working on all these levels and not really try uh, uh, sacrifice prior knowledge once we shift to the next exciting thing. Uh, we have often done that, and I think that has come at expense of progress. Uh, so, this is, for example, one way how we can proceed. Uh, I think that we can very uh, much better align basic science with uh, uh, occurrences and uh, uh, what we know about mental diseases. We know, for example, that uh, autism spectrum disorders, schizophrenia, uh, ADHD have a very strong genetic and neurodevelopmental component. We can then tailor our research from the known genetics and go back uh, to, uh, with backward translation to artificial systems to understand what these genes are doing and how they interact. We also know that affective disorders are tightly linked to stressful experiences, uh, addiction uh, to drug actions and drug use, and there is also another area which I'm currently working on with colleagues to uh, improve is understanding of psychiatric illness in, uh, caused by different medical conditions. Almost every somatic disease uh, uh, comes with a set of uh, significant mental dis disorders. Stroke, heart attack, autoimmune diseases. We had recently the opportunity to see uh, the devastating consequences of COVID. So the brain is not isolated and very often we can learn about uh, different mental states, not only by studying the brain, but also by looking at the brain uh, as it responds to other uh, diseases uh, in the body. Now, what we have used in my lab a lot, and I will not show the data, but the way we are approaching that is to really try to use phenotypes uh, uh, which we can see easily in animals, and we also see them in patients who suffer from mental illness. For example, overgeneralization of negative memory is quite common to depression, resistance to fear extinction to post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, dissociative amnesia with severe traumas during adolescence and childhood, uh, social withdrawal, defeat and instability to various stress conditions and stress-related disorders, and ultimately processing negative valence for all kinds of negative affective states. Uh, one reason why I do believe that this is a helpful starting point is because these phenotypes really match very well to various functional domains uh, of psychological and brain processes of human patients. Uh, what is really helpful these days, where I believe we'll see a lot of advantages, that uh, basic science and human research are coming closer. They're coming closer because, first of all, the techniques for human imaging are, are improved uh, uh, as we speak. Their resolution is better, uh, so we can very soon expect to see changes even at the cellular level uh, through brain imaging. 
we can also manipulate locally parts of the brain. And for the first time, we actually have ways to read at least some of the brain changes at the molecular level by isolating brain-derived exosomes. So we now have uh, particles in the blood which are secreted from the brain where we can, by isolation and analysis of their content, figure out what's happening in the brain in a reasonably non-invasive manner. We can also engineer exosomes for uh, facilitating brain-specific therapies, and we can design them to uh, 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 access diseased parts of the brain or dysfunctional parts of the brain uh, easier than before. Now, uh, uh, we have learned much so far, and I would like to highlight several things which could explain why we haven't succeeded as well as we would have wanted to. Uh, we have, for example, discovered that behavior and experience uh, are, are very often uh, genetically determined. Until recently, we didn't know how to do that and what to do about that. However, we now have CRISP-CASP approaches, genome editing approaches, and there is a lot of hope that many of developmental disorders could be addressed by uh, uh, using genetical uh, uh, approaches and genome editing. Now, this here come the really complicated things. Uh, when we look at uh, mental illness, when you look at their symptoms, if you talk about depression, that means nothing when you look at mechanisms, because depression can be induced by changes of serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine, opiates, different peptides. So this is a symptom. Depression is not a disease caused by a single agent. On the contrary, another complication comes from the fact that if you look at single transmitter, we'll see that one transmitter will affect many different behaviors. So if we use classical therapeutic drugs as we are used to, we first of all may be hitting the wrong system. Second, we will have a lot of side effects because we will target brain functions that are not intended. Uh, now, another big problem that we have been facing, uh, especially in our research on PTSD, is the fact that memories, for example, have the power to, ex to really influence our mental health very much. Our past experiences hold our happiness now and in the future. Uh, the problem is that memories are very vastly distributed in the brain. So how can we handle that? How can it is not one single memory that one can modify or attenuate? Well, it turns out that there are possibilities, but we haven't used them yet, and I will come to that in a moment. Uh, and uh, uh, I will highlight now here one thing which is really important, because uh, our world of neuroscience was very excited when we discovered the phenomenon of neuronal plasticity. We know that the brain is plastic. We know that the brain can learn, and it can learn better than any other cell or organ in the body. So why is it so that we can't change the brain so difficult? Why can't we do uh, an act in patients who suffer from mental disorders to get them out of depression or to attenuate their PTSD or to stop their addiction? Well, what is becoming very clear uh, recently is that there is a very strong force in the brain as well, and this force opposes plasticity, and that is called homeostatic plasticity, and I will show you how oh, I killed it. Not yet. Uh, with a very simple example, what it means. Imagine that this is a drug, either alcohol or a benzodiazepine or any drug which would increase inhibitory transmission in the brain. For some reason, in increasing inhibition in the brain causes pleasure. We like that. As humans, really, inhibitory substances are those that make us feel well and those that we crave and those that we uh, use. So once we increase inhibition in the brain, you can see suddenly uh, something happens in the synapse. What the neuron does, it is upregulated excitation to counterbalance. The brain wants to keep its homeostatic state. It doesn't want to shift a lot. And then if suddenly there is no alcohol or no opiate or no benzodiazepine, we have severe withdrawal symptoms uh, only for this reason because the homeostatic plasticity has taken place. And now we have to reverse all these changes before we can find another stable state where patients can actually feel comfortable without more urge 
to seek their old patterns. Uh, another big problem is that we can never change one part of the brain, the activity, without changing a big part of the remaining network. We almost have butterflies effect there. It's like really a huge electric network. If you have shortcut in one place, it will be felt throughout. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two other uh, uh, issues where we actually can do something, which is uh, to uh, try to combine approaches that we are developing with approaches that we know work for humans, which is try to uh, uh, deal at the same time with their trauma, with their symptoms, while we are imaging, while we are treating because that's the best way for us to target the diseased parts of the brain. We can't just have patients take medication because they will not work on circuits that are not active at the moment uh, uh, when the patients are medicated. And lastly, the only way I assume to get around all this variability in causes and symptoms and transmitters is to really approach individually every patient and try to figure out uh, what is the cause of their uh, mental disease uh, and uh, using this approach, actually, once we have personalized medicine, we don't have to worry about uh, rich or poor or diversity or this ethnic group or that. Every individual will actually be his or her own world uh, uh, with tailored therapy. Now, uh, these are some things which are ahead of us. I don't know. I don't want to overstep my time, so please. Uh, uh, I have a minute or? Two minutes, please. Two minutes, okay, thank you. Uh, so these are some things that are ahead of us as a challenge. We really need to understand multigenic contributions to organization of brain activity. You know, if we see uh, patients and we tell them, oh, you know, uh, actually it's not one gene, but there are many genes, they're confused. And honestly, even we are confused because we assume that it's multigenic, but we don't really know what it means. You know, uh, 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 how many genes are necessary? What is it that these genes are doing? How do they interact to cause this condition? We need to have better ways to describe this level uh, uh, of uh, uh, inheritance and uh, disease uh, progression. Uh, we do need to do much better in understanding uh, 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 gene environment interactions. Uh, and we need to take much better advantage of negative data. For example, there is this very impressive finding in rodents. Female rodents don't develop depression or depression-like behavior to any inflammatory challenge, which is really surprising because in humans, it's females who develop more depression than males, and inflammation is a big factor. So somewhere in this evolutionary road, we have lost that protection. And in rodents, it's known that the protection is conferred by BDNF. And instead of taking advantage of that, we are now working on finding new models that would cause depression in rodent females. Uh, so in a way, this negative data in rodents, uh, uh, we are not using enough to, to uh, frame hypothesis in humans. Uh, I think the rest is really not very deep. Uh, anyway, and I just want to finish before I thank my lab. Uh, uh, I read about many problems in sustainability from climate change and so, but the speaker here is most terrified from bureaucracy. I think that we will be in a completely unsustainable world if uh, uh, bureaucratic constraints over basic science and the rest of our lives will keep increasing the way they have been increasing. Because the time spent on bureaucracy, if we had the same time to spend on science, we would have done much better. And uh, this, uh, are the people in my lab who hopefully I can one day present their work rather than give such a general talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Radulovic. Very nice talk. And um, I believe everybody is uh, interested in the brain and the mind, and uh, I assume that the discussion will be interested. So our last, last speaker uh, will appear via video, um, Mr. Zhugao Li, Liu. Uh, the organizers are ready for the uh, interpretation? Are we ready? Please start. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my presentation. Thank you for inviting me to attend the World Conference 
on basic sciences and sustainable development. My name is Jun Guo Liu. I'm a vice president of the North China University of Water Resources and Electric Power. Uh, I would like to talk about water security and its linkage to sustainable development. First of all, I would like to introduce my university. This university is co-sponsored by the Henan Province and the Ministry of Water Resources of China. It is a teaching and research university established in 1951. It is a public university specializing in the field of water resources and hydropower. We have a lot of excellent alumni, including three ministers of water resources of China and several governors, academicians. And we also have a very famous writer. Uh, he is Si Xin Liu. He wrote uh, a novel, a science fiction called The Three Body Problem. So before I talk about world security, I would like to introduce my work at the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. IPCC is the United Nations body for assessing the facts related to climate change. I'm very lucky to be involved in the uh, Working Group 2 contribution of the Fixed Assessment Report of IPCC, which was released on February 28th this year. And for our Working Group 2 contribution, and this includes 18 chapters, seven cross-chapter papers, and two annexes. Uh, we have 270 authors in total from 67 countries. Uh, we have reviewed more than 34,000 scientific papers to prepare our IPCC uh, report contribution. And we also received more than 62,000 review comments. We have to address all these comments one by one. And this picture shows our IPCC Working Group 2 team, uh, team members. So I'm mainly involved in the chapter 4, and this chapter is related to water, so chapter 4 water. And for our chapter, we have 12 lead authors in total, and we also have two review editors. So this is a picture showing the lead authors. And the start of the story in our chapter in the IPCC report is water scarcity and water security. And based on our literature review, we found that about 4 billion people are estimated to experience severe water scarcity for at least one month per year. And since the 1970s, 44% of all disaster events have been flood related and about 60% adaptation interventions is caused in response to water-related hazards. So this, this, uh, uh, this map showing the, uh, the spatial distribution of water scarcity for all over the world. And we can see the regions in red. These are the regions with severe water scarcity. And water security is more broad. Water scarcity is only one aspect of water security. So for our chapter, the chapter water, the first key finding is the intensification of the hydrological cycle due to human-induced climate change is affecting physical aspects of water security, thereby exacerbating existing water-related vulnerabilities caused by other social economic factors. And this is the first founding we, we got in our chapter 4, Water. And also there, there are many publications uh, worked on water scarcity and water security. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Risks uh, Report 2020, water crises are categorized as the largest social risk. The water scarcity is also a very big concern of the sustainable development goals. And for the target fixed point four 
of SDGs, it is explicitly mentioned to address water scarcity and substantially reduce the number of people suffering from water scarcity. So when we talk about water scarcity as assessment, one very important scientist is Marlene Falkenmark. So she started to work on water scarcity assessment in the 1980s, and he introduced the very famous water availability per capita as an indicator to show uh, to assess the water scarcity, and this is also uh, called the Falkenmark indicator. So if we look uh, into the history of water scarcity assessment, we found that there are more and more publications since the 1980s, and also there are many methods that were used to assess uh, water scarcity. Since the 1980s, water scarcity assessment has mainly focused on quantity-induced water scarcity. However, with intense human activities, Quality-induced water scarcity and ecological water scarcity have become key constraints for sustainable development. Therefore, there is a need of three-dimensional water scarcity assessment by considering not only the quantity-induced water scarcity, but also the quality-induced water scarcity and also the ecological water scarcity. So if we look at these factors, we found that uh, in addition to quantity-induced water scarcity, quality-induced water scarcity, and also ecological water scarcity are both also very important. More than 80% of the waste water resulting from human activities is discharged into rivers or sea without any pollution removal. And the coastal waters are deteriorating due to pollution and nutrification. So for SDGs, there are specific targets to improve water scarcity and also to increase the health of ecosystems. Water scarcity is defined as the lack of fresh water resources to meet the standard water demand of required quantity or quality. This demand is either from social economic sectors or for human beings or from ecosystems or for the nature. So uh, we define three types of water scarcity. Quantity-induced water scarcity, that means the quantity of water is not sufficient to meet human demand. Quality-induced water scarcity means the quality of water is not sufficient to meet human demand. And ecological water scarcity means the quantity or quality of water is not sufficient to meet demand of ecosystems. As I mentioned, there are quite a lot of assessments for quantity-induced water scarcity, and there are specific indicators for such uh, assessment. By integrating the quantity-induced water scarcity indicators with river footprint, we can work on two-dimensional water scarcity assessment. Here, the river footprint is defined as the total amount of fresh water needed to assimil assimilate pollutants to meet specific water quality standards. And by combining the indicators for quantity in use water scarcity and green water footprint with development methods to assess the two-dimensional water scarcity. So for this method, we consider not only the quantity in use, but also the quality in use water scarcity. And the, the first application of such a method is used for the capital city of China or the Beijing city. And we also develop a water scarcity meter to show the level of water scarcity. So like here, the green triangle shows the level of quality-induced water scarcity. If it's above the red dash line, that means the quality-induced water scarcity occurs. So we also have a blue triangle showing the quantity-induced water scarcity indicator. 
And based on our assessment, we found that for the Beijing city as a whole, it was suffering from both quantity and quality induced water scarcity. And all river basins had quantity induced water scarcity. That means there is not sufficient water for Beijing for each river basin, but only a few river basins we were suffering from, from quality induced water, water, water scarcity. And, and this is such a uh, method. method we assess the water scarcity for all over China for different provinces. And in this map, the green color shows the provinces with quality induced water scarcity. And the red color shows the provinces with both the quantity and quality induced water scarcity. And we found that for many provinces in the northern part of China, we were suffering from both quantity and quality induced water scarcity, but many provinces here in the middle or in the south eastern part of China, but also uh, for one province, the Jinning province in North China, these provinces were suffering from quality induced water scarcity. When we compare quantity and quality induced water scarcity, we found in China at the provincial level, quality induced water scarcity is more severe than quantity induced water scarcity because for all provinces with quantity induced water scarcity, they were also suffering from quality induced water scarcity. And our method is, is used to assess uh, the global water scarcity uh, by other colleagues like uh, for the colleagues from Yafa and Austria, we also uh, use a very similar method to assess the water scarcity uh, by sector, including water quality for all over the world. And for the two-dimensional water scarcity, uh, we mainly focus on the water scarcity for human beings. So these are the human-centered assessment. But we also need to consider the health of ecosystem. So we need to develop uh, methods to assess the three-dimensional water scarcity by considering not only human being, but also the nature. So the first method we, we use uh, for the three-dimensional water scarcity, we use the method to assess the water scarcity situation for uh, a river basin in, in the Mongolia, in the northern part of China. Here we developed a method to assess water scarcity by considering environmental flow requirements, water quantity, and water quality. And then later on, we further developed new methods to assess the ecological water scarcity. And here, this is the first map for ecological water scarcity for China and for each provinces. And we can see that the provinces with red color means those provinces were suffering from severe ecological water scarcity. And the pink colors shows the provinces with significant or moderate ecological water scarcity. And the green color means the ecological water scarcity is very low. So mainly, uh, many provinces in the northern part, uh, they have severe to moderate ecological water scarcity. But also for one province located in southeast of China, the Guangdong province, uh, it is also suffering from uh, moderate ecological water scarcity. And we can show the change of ecological water scarcity with time. And by compare the ecological water scarcity in 2019 and 2016, we found that in many provinces in the northern part of China, the green color, the green color mean, means that the human intervention has helped to mitigate ecological water scarcity in these provinces in China. So mainly because the government spent a lot of money to uh, to clean the water and to reduce the pollution. 
And how to address the ecological water scarcity in China? I would like to show two cases. One case is in Beijing, the capital city of China. Based on our assessment, Beijing was suffering from severe ecological water scarcity. And this uh, situation is mainly because uh, there is a lack of water resources uh, in, in the Beijing city. Uh, the mother river of Beijing is the Yunyun Yun River, and we can see that the incoming flow to the Yunyun Yun River is dec uh, was decreasing from time to time, uh, uh, largely because uh, the development of a reservoir in the upstream. And uh, in the early 2000s, the Yunyun River ran dry in the downstream. So, so this, this is, is a picture, picture I took in the year 2010, and, and you cannot find the river because the river ran dry. And, and you see this is the picture of the river, but there is no any water here. here. And, and we have spent a lot of efforts to restore the Mother River of Beijing or the Yunyun River. river. And, and this is the picture I took in the year 2014, and you can see that the, the river ecosystem has improved a lot. And in May 2020, the Yunyun River received the environmental flows for the entire Beijing section for the first time in this century after 25 years of running dry. So you can see the big improvement. And the second case is to address the ecological water scarcity in Shenzhen province. And the Shenzhen is located in the Guangdong province. And here, the Shenzhen uh, has very uh, significant ecological water scarcity, mainly because of the, uh, the water quality. And you can see uh, polluted rivers uh, in Shenzhen provinces, in Shenzhen city. And the mother river of Shenzhen is the Mozhou River. And we also call this river as a Yink River. Uh, because it's highly polluted. So, so in fact, in, in, in Shenzhen, there are many, many uh, rivers uh, suffering from, from uh, ecological water scarcity, mainly because of pollution. And, and we have worked a lot to restore the river. So you can see the, the difference a bit, uh, for the Fim River at different times. And after the restoration, the river ecosystem becomes much better. And, and here, this, this is a video to show a river we have restored. You can see very clean water, and you can also see fishes in the river after restoration. And specifically for the Mother River of Shenzhen or the Mozhou River, and this is a picture before 2016, and then after restoration, the concentration of many pollutants have decreased significantly in the past few years. And this is a picture showing the Mojo River after restoration. And the local people, they also organized the dragon boat races for Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau region in the Mojo River after restoration. So we have uh, concluded uh, the water scarcity theory and, and then we developed the three-dimensional water scarcity theory, and we published the theory in Chinese Science Bulletin as a cover paper. And also, we established a specific working group uh, for International Association of Hydraulic Sciences in the year 2014. AAHS established a working group on water scarcity assessment, and the only aim is to develop methods for water scarcity assessment by considering environmental flow requirements, water quantity, and water quality. And we have many experts from all over the world. I'm the chair for this assessment working group. And you can see scientists from Europe, from US, from Asia. And five years later, after the establishment of this working group in 2019, UN launched a guideline for incorporating environmental flows in water scarcity assessment. So I would like to conclude my talk with these messages. 
water features prominently in the Sustainable Development Goals. Intensification of the hydrologic cycle due to climate change is affecting physical aspects of water security. Our water scarcity is one very important aspect of water insecurity. A three-dimensional water scarcity assessment explicitly considers quantity in use, quality in use, and ecological water scarcity. We need to assess ecological water scarcity among countries, and immediate interventions are needed to act rapidly towards achieving water security, sustainable development goals, and climate resilient development worldwide. So that's all for my presentation. I also would like to thank my team for their great support. And I also want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Junrao Liu. Thank you for this video presentation. And um, ladies and gentlemen, now the um, session is open for discussion. We have uh, 10 minutes, almost 15, uh, counting on the uh, little delay uh, with the start. So please. Thank you. Uh, the microphone, the microphone is for you. Thank you. Uh, my question is. Oh, you can, you can, you can put it, no problem. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is something mean? No, no, go, go, go ahead. All right. So my question is about uh, for, for the presenter on water security. I come from Pakistan, which is currently facing massive and huge floods as a result of climate change. So the question is, uh, water scarcity is one issue, but what about um, excessive amounts of water overflows? And how, do, uh, how does that become part of the larger con conversation about water preservation and water security? Thank you very much for this question. But unfortunately, we don't have the presenter with us. But what we oh, have- uh, Would he what, not be, would he no, not be able not to- No, he's not with us. It, it, oh, it was I'm a sorry. video presentation. Oh, but what we have with us is the president of the, of the Serbian uh, International Hydrology Program, Professor Despotovic, who is just behind you. So maybe he can answer you the, uh, the question. Good morning, everybody. I'm very much satisfied being with you today. Since uh, water people, water professionals, do not deal with science every day, but rather deal with uh, droughts and floods. You have floods, and uh, in Europe, there were, uh, still is a very big drought, drought for three months or four months already. So uh, it is, as it is this obvious, it's a very complex problem. But I would like all of you to, to, to pay attention to what was said a uh, couple of minutes ago by our colleague from China, that uh, uh, environmental issue, uh, to my experience, encompasses much more than just quality and quantity of water. So it's even environment. It's even global changes included. So we forgot what we did 100 years ago for water. We forgot how much of the forests we burned. We forgot how much people we put or pressed or pushed to immigration. For instance, one of the, the major and the, probably the, 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 the very easy to understand problem is RLC. In, the, in, in Asia, what had happened in last hundred years? Some 80 years ago, uh, Soviet Union wanted to be the first in production of cotton. And they destroyed each and every uh, idea about preserving the natural state of the two big rivers, Sir Daria and Amur Daria. And nowadays there are hundreds of attempts and projects trying to recollect, to refurbish, to reorganize, to reforest the, the wide area of thousands of kilometers squared, which is not possible. But on the other hand, we have to add 
and I'm sorry that we cannot discuss with, with, with the colleague from China, we have to add our mental or environmental or social aspects <coughs> sorry, of all of these uh, consequences that we are facing today. Thank you very much, Professor Thank Skotovic. You. We have another question from the audience here. Uh, thank you, all presenters, for wonderful speeches. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, our first presenter, Isaac, uh, who, I congratulate you for a really nice speech. I'm wondering why the people in clinical medicine don't use uh, what you found, uh, like this microenvironment, and what would be the best way to use this in order to prevent so many deaths for, from cancer? Thank you. If I can add to this question, because I have the same for the, for the Professor Witz, what is the relationship between your research and the, and the clinical oncology in terms of recommendation that we have annually in, in oncology? Which is the same question, I would say. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, targeting the microenvironment and the interaction between the microenvironment and tumor cells is now the big hit in oncology. Uh, the recent advances, what everybody is talking about in the newspaper in uh, uh, immunotherapy of cancer, this is the uh, blocking of, um, of the immune checkpoint that was hijacked by tumor cells, is, I think, the latest example of, uh, of uh, uh, targeting the, uh, the tumor microenvironment. I'm another attempt that has been done a lot, success is so-so, is inhibition of angiogenesis. Uh, Judah Folkman, I don't know if you uh, remember the name, a big name, uh, has already postulated in the, in the 70s, early 70s, that if you block out, uh, angiogenesis, in other words, the blood supply uh, of, uh, of tumors and of metastases, you can uh, attempt to, to, to cure. Uh, but uh, the attempts were so-so, and uh, I'd like just to mention a, a, a little uh, answer he gave to one of the newspapers who asked the same question. He said, if you are a mouse, we can help you. In other words, in mouse experiment, it worked. In humans, not so much. But there are quite a lot quite a lot of uh, clinical attempts already in phase three that, that uh, uh, use and target various aspects of the tumor microenvironment. So it is, it has already progressed much beyond uh, the theoretical phase. So it is the immunotherapy uh, trend and the personalized approach trend so, uh, uh, what is the what is about the safety issue on the immunotherapy? Do you have some research uh, results on the on the, on the safety issue? Well, uh, the therapy is quite safe. As I'm myself not a clinician, so I cannot. Uh, but what I read the the um, the trouble of immunotherapy, like with most other therapies, is the acquisition of a resistance. Uh, there is an outgrowth, a Darwinian uh, truth, there's an outgrowth of the resistant cancer cells. Uh, and uh, those are a cause of much of the failure of many therapies including uh, including immunotherapy. But if you look at the balance of, uh, of the advantages and disadvantages of this form of therapy, I think it's probably the most promising therapy developed so far. Uh, uh, and with other improvements of various aspects of immunotherapy, uh, this may be a reasonable, uh, bright future. Thank you. Some other comments? Quite, yeah, please. Uh, I would have uh, one question to uh, Professor Radulovic, please. <coughs> uh, this um, 
uh, you mentioned this homeostatic plasticity versus uh, synaptic plasticity of the brain. Uh, could you comment this uh, from the evolutionary perspective? Because uh, each organism, as well as each organ, has to maintain uh, two opposing tasks, adaptation and maintaining its own structure, and in case of brain, its knowledge accumulated during phylogenesis and ontogenesis. Yeah, so one way to explain the homeostatic plasticity is that uh, the brain typically, throughout early development, selects something called the baseline state. And typically that's the state from which the brain moves in and out the easiest. Uh, because most of our responses to environmental challenge are actually normal. Everything that we think is pathological in a mental state, it's not an abnormal phenomenon. It's just the normal getting out, out of uh, 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 getting, uh, becoming too strong, too persistent, or too intense. So every symptom that we see in a mental illness are normal responses to the environment. The problem is that we have to be in a state from which we can go in and out. Once we form a stable state, which is maladaptive, as we see in depression or PTSD, these are the epigenetic changes that cement these new states, then we really have problems to get out of there. And for that, we really need to find approaches. And I do believe that targeting epigenetic mechanisms are really holding a lot of promise in the future uh, for that. Yeah. OK, one last question. OK, um, really it's also for the last speaker. I know he can't answer us, uh, but uh, a comment uh, on something he said, uh, that water management has to be between countries. A very small comment, but extremely important because um, we are in a situation where water scarcity is going to increase massively. We saw the Yangtze dry up in China this year dramatically, the chart in Europe and so on. And what are we going to have, water diplomacy or water wars? Because <clears throat> war is a con continuation of diplomacy by other means, they say. So, Really, we have to get onto this before it becomes critical. So it, I think it's critical now to, to start the diplomacy to, to regulate this in a rational way. For example, in the Mekong, you know, should China try and, you know, uh, take as much water upstream as possible or should they make a deal? And should there be a rational solution whereby, say, food is grown or water is taken for agriculture where it is the most effective, most fertile, you know, so that there's a rational path and there's a competitive destructive pathway, um, but it's not easy to, to manage it, so I think we need to get onto this very quick. Thank you very much. It's hard to believe that we have so, man, so many oceans and uh, not enough water, but if you are counting, therefore the UNESCO is having one of the main issues uh, called oceans, just oceans regarding these microplastics uh, elements in the oceans and the purity of the water. So it is important, it was important in, in a lecture to stress that not only the quantity then the quality of water is, is uh, very essential for us. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, first of all, presenters, for the wonderful uh, presentation and discussion and the audience. So we continue with the, with the next session. I, I, I wish you all the best.